Hey, Blake T. Wild here, and I am back for another exciting episode of What Is. And today we are covering the very first Grant Morrison and Frank Quitely comic that I've ever covered on the channel before, which is weird because Grant Morrison is one of my favorite comic writers, writers in general, and Frank Quitely is one of my favorite comic book artists. Odd that I haven't covered either of their works in the uh, seven years that I've been doing this YouTube channel. But here we are, and it's something special, that's for sure. DC's all-star imprint saw star DC comic book characters be given a free reign treatment by all-star writers and artists. They were limited to nothing. They could do whatever they wanted with the characters completely out of continuity. But with only three titles ever actually released, two because the line technically ended in about 2008-2009 with the end of All-Star Superman, it was effectively a failure. With only one of these titles that was released under the imprint being regarded well, <laughs> the other is All-Star Batman and Robin the Boy Wonder. I've talked about that ad nauseum in my hour and a half long Frank Miller's Batman uh, video essay analysis thing that I posted about a year ago. So go check that out. That was what started DC's All-Star imprint and followed by what I'm covering today, All-Star Superman, which was then technically followed by All-Star Batman by Scott Snyder and various other artists, mostly John Romita Jr., which was like just a, a relabel pretty much of the Batman comic storyline during uh, Rebirth. But there was going to be way more all-star DC stories that just never happened for some reason. Announced in 2006, All-Star Wonder Woman by Adam Hughes, All-Star Batgirl by Jeff Johns and J.G. Johns, around the 2010 to 2016 time before and during the time of All-Star Batman, there was going to be all-Star Green Lantern by Brian Azzarello and Cliff Chang. And it was supposed to be about Jon Stewart. And I could only find one piece of, like, discussion or evidence that this was ever going to be a thing. And it's on this now defunct webpage of a Green Lantern fan website from about 10 years ago or so now. And it's described by Cliff Chang as, quote, part of a larger project that went away. Now that last one about the All-Star Green Lantern is interesting because that would have been like in the time of Jeff Johns' Green Lantern run, the seminal run that is Jeff Johns' Green Lantern, the most commercially and critically successful Green Lantern series since Green Lantern Mosaic back in the 80s. And that's most likely the reason for the larger project going away. But the failure of All-Star Comics by DC is not what I'm here to talk about today. No what if, this is what is. <laughs> um, I am here to talk about one of the greatest Superman comics of all time because it's fantastic and I need to really get around to covering it. And also because it's apparently uh, one of the primary inspirations for James Gunn's... James Gunn's? For James Gunn's Superman legacy film along with Superman for All Seasons and Superman Birthright, the latter of which I have already covered. Check that out. Released in 2005, written by Grant Morrison, with art by Frank Quitely. This is All-Star Superman. Doomed planet. Brilliant scientists. Last hope. Kindly couple. We're falling into a sunspot the size of South America. Fear is just the sauce on the steak of life. I promised I'd bring back a spoonful of sun, and I refused to let a little thing like an engine failure hold me back. Leo's not quite ready to die yet. But I am. See, I just remembered something. I'm a genetically modified suicide bomb in human form. Death, courtesy of Lex Luthor. Lex Luthor told the world he had reformed, and for some reason the whole world believed him and doubted us. I don't have to tell you, I'm proud of every one of you who stuck by the planet's integrity in its darkest hour. But Lex Luthor lied, like he always lies. Investing heavily in water, 
damming more than 15 rivers with the intent to profit from a global water shortage brought about by the tampering of the sun. This is tomorrow's front page. We're breaking the story of the century. I am approaching critical mass! Lex, are you talking to yourself again? Fusion will occur in 30 seconds. Lex, I just had a call from one of our people in Washington. He said something about journalists? Excuse me, General. I'm remote controlling a weapon with a voice command sequence I designed. The signal takes nine minutes to reach the sun. I had to time my transition exactly. The sun? Luther, we released you from jail to work for us. For your country. Well, I've tried to be a model citizen, General <coughs> Lane. I know I promised I wouldn't waste my intellect on kryptonite robots and elaborate super death traps. I know that. But three months ago, I looked in the mirror at those nasty little spider webs of lines around my eyes, and I realized something. I'm getting older, and he isn't. SOS! SOS! Somebody Nobody help! Nobody can help you here. I'm approaching critical mass. Fusion will occur in 30 seconds. Not if I can help it. The purpose of my existence is to explode! You have no right to limit my ambitions, fascist! No right at all to stand in the way of my self-realization! You misunderstand. I'm here to help you with that. Blow the hatch, Quintum. Superman then aids the solar shuttle back to projects, that's an acronym, Lunar Base, and is later tested by Dr. Leo Quintum. They discover Superman has now tripled in strength, and they still haven't found an upper limit. He's manifested one new superpower, but others may appear. And then Leo Quintum, in his Technicolor dream coat, says this. Your trip to the sun exposed you to critical levels of stellar radiation and more energy than your cells are able to process efficiently. Apoptosis has begun. There can be only one outcome, even for you. Superman is then led through Leo's lab. They have discovered that Superman's cells have been super saturated with solar radiation, and Leo apologizes to the Man of Steel for being a pawn in Lex Luthor's plan to kill him. Sometime later, Superman stands outside of the complex, gazing out upon the moon's surface. Leo appears and tells Superman he too is trying to escape a doomed world, a world called the past. Leo explains that when he resurrected the DNA Project, a creation of Jack Kirby's back when he was on Superman's pal Jimmy Olsen. Anyway, Leo says that when he resurrected the project, he had a single goal in mind, to create a race of superhumans in the event that something happened to Superman. Leo then leads Superman through the facility, introducing him to his partner, Agatha, who is like some kind of genetically modified empath or something. It doesn't really come up. They're photosynthetic giant bizarre worker drones and artificial beings titled Voyager Titans that they send out for deep space exploration and their nanonauts. Leo then promises that he will find a way to save Kal-El. Superman says that no one can know about this. At least not yet. Later, Superman and Lois walk through Metropolis. Lois talks about Lex Luthor's arrest, while Clark asks if she ever thinks about death. She asks why he's being so morbid all of a sudden, and Clark accidentally walks into a man who yells that Lois's boyfriend is a clumsy idiot, to which Lois replies, He's not my idiot. Oh my, my thanks, Lois. L uh, Lois? There, well, um... There was something I wanted to tell you, and- but this is about the trial coverage. We can go over all that manana. Lois, please stop talking for just one second. I have something to tell you. 
Later, Superman flies Lois in her heated car to the Fortress of Solitude as she says that she still does not believe he's been Clark Kent this entire time. Which is a very sort of Silver Age thing in which Lois constantly believes that there's something going on between Clark and Superman. She's just never been able to prove it. And now that it has been proven to her, she's in a lot of denial. Superman lands her down at the entrance and she agrees to go along with this little charade in what she can only assume to be a trick devised by Clark. Superman uses his now normal sized key to open the door to the fortress and the two are greeted by robot Superman that he confiscated from the toy maker. Then he leads her inside. And they enter the hall of the fortress, an assortment of pieces that Superman has either confiscated or collected rests inside as robots tend to the premises. Later that evening, Lois writes about her day with Superman. Lois Lane, Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, and I don't know what to think about this. Does I have to do something with my birthday tomorrow? Is this where it all turns serious at last? Is this where Superman's girlfriend finally gets what she's always wanted? When we're married 15 years, when I'm sagging and he looks just the same, will he still meet me and say things like, These are for you. I picked them on Alpha Centauri 4. Or is he just setting me up for another big joke? Superman then gives her a tour of the fortress, and eventually they reach a room where he keeps all of his, like, confiscated weapons of mass destruction from all over the galaxy. Then he shows her the time telescope, and he takes the time to show her how it works, explaining that so far he can only receive very cryptic messages from the far future. The messages are primarily from Cal Kent, the Man of Steel of Tomorrow from the year 853,450. We fought Solaris, the tyrant son, again in the year 5 500,000. Cal Kent, huh? This fortress isn't a museum, Lois. It's a it's a time capsule. One day some future man or woman will open that door with that key. And when they do, I want them to know how it felt to live at the dawn of the age of superheroes. Then he takes her to the Phantom Zone map room. A pretty dull experience unless you're able to see negative radio anti-waves. But he does have a baby sun eater that he keeps as a pet. Superman then forges a miniature sun on his cosmic anvil and feeds the big fella. Lois stumbles into a room. A strange room containing a single robot working at a control console and even stranger images on the screens behind it. Superman says that this room is off limits and walks her away, kindly ordering Robot 7 to report for repair. Later, they have dinner aboard the restored Titanic. Lois belittles herself for being one of the finest investigative journalists in the world, according to Time Magazine, but not once did she ever actually prove that Clark was Superman's disguise. Superman sits down and Lois asks when Clark, Jimmy, and Perry are actually gonna pop up and yell, surprise and happy birthday. Superman laughs it off and provides her with a menu from the actual Titanic on which he has grown and picked all the ingredients and prepared every single thing on the menu. He says that his time in the sun not only increased his strength, but also his curiosity, imagination, and creativity. And then he tells her, Lois, please, I am Clark. Aren't you happy your suspicions were right all along? What about the time Clark was witness in the Bosco Morandi trial and you accompanied him everywhere as his bodyguard? Batman was standing in for him. Or that time Clark presented you with the Metropolis Man of the Millennium? That was a robot. Clark Kent and Superman are one and the same person. I swear. I wouldn't lie to you. If Clark Kent is seriously Superman, or the other way around, whatever, if it was all a ruse, that would mean you've been lying to me for years, wouldn't it? So why confide in me now, after all this time? I... I can't tell you why, Lois. You have to trust me. Said with such conviction. You're acting very strangely, Superman. And I'm not sure I like it. What if something's happened to his mind and he's brought me here to be part of some awful experiment he's planning in that room? <sighs> Mirror of truth, huh? <sighs> how can I... How can I tell her I only wanted us to have this time together? <sighs> because it may be our last. What if he's telling the truth? What if there really was some part of him that was bumbling? Ulfish Kent. <sighs> how can I spoil her birthday? the news that I'm dying. I have to be ready. 
I have to protect myself. I need a weapon, just in case something. Anybody there? Come in. Hello? Cal Kent? No. I am the unknown Superman of 4500 AD. It is terrible. Darkness is here. But ask three questions. Will Superman and I ever marry and have children? I need to know. The horrible answer is before you. Now, my question. Future must know. Great conundrum. Answer first. Reception poor. Listen carefully. Who? Who? Was? J-Lo? That's Superman from the future. He covered his face because he transformed into some kind of hideous monster. Superman of the present saw a vision of his own future, and now he's brought me here to be the mother of the race of deformed superhuman horrors. He has to be stopped. Superman! Superman? Ow. Oh my god! Well, that was an interesting way to learn that I've become immune to green kryptonite radiation. Mind if I just take that from you, Lois? Robot 7 had a data processing problem, it would seem, and he left the lab door open while I was synthesizing some alien chemicals. They can cause visual distortions and extreme paranoia. But that awful room with the dissecting machine? What you saw was a super sewing machine. It uses diamond tip needles to weave light, indestructible threads. What are you talking about? I'm so sorry I kept disappearing, but I wanted to make your birthday present in. <laughs> At six billion letters, it takes even me a long time to read and memorize an entire DNA code. You almost spoiled my surprise. These are xenogenes. I've been making them to allow a human being to duplicate my powers for 24 hours. Happy birthday, Lois Lane. Sometime later, giant dinosaur men wreak havoc in Metropolis. Jimmy Olsen, Steve Lombard, the sports columnist, and Cat Grant, gossip columnist, hang out atop the roof of the Daily Planet watching the chaos. And Jimmy activates his Superman signal watch. And they look up to the sky and see... Superman and Super Lois. Superman apologizes to her for the inconvenience of all this happening on her birthday, and she's like, what's the point in having your superpowers if I don't have some, like, bad guys to fight? But before they, but before they have the chance to act, Samson, yes, that Samson, appears and chucks the lead dinosaur straight off the planet. Then Atlas appears as well. They ask how Lois is. Well, Samson does, because they've met before. And Atlas says that she has the looks, intellect, and skin of steel that he demands of a woman. Lois brushes him aside as Superman returns with the leader lizard and tells them that the lady is with him. Then Samson suggests that they each perform a super feat of strength in honor of Lois Lane, and whoever does the most incredible wins her company for the day. Then they return the dinosaur Krull and his army back to the Emperor of the sub and Superman learns that Krull was goaded into invading Metropolis by Samson. As Samson offers Lois a necklace of radioactive crown jewels from the Ultra Sphinx of the 80th century, Lois sort of flirts with both of them. Superman pulls her aside and asks to speak. Lois says that she's teaching him a lesson after the creepy and ridiculous impersonation of Clark Kent he did last night. Superman then tells her again that he's not pretending to be Clark, he is Clark. She won't believe him and says that it doesn't matter because they both know that he's gonna win against those losers anyway. She then heads off, followed by Atlas, but Superman stops Sam and asks him what he has to do to make them both go away. Samson opens his bag and tells Superman that, according to his time-traveling sources, Lois isn't gonna be his girl for much longer. And then he says it looks like she'll be needing a shoulder to cry on pretty soon. They start walking back to Lois when a bright blue light bursts before them and the Ultra Sphinx appears. Putting Lois into a state of quantum uncertainty, it tells Superman that to answer correctly is life. Failure to answer correctly is death. Samson apologizes and explains that they couldn't defeat the Ultra Sphinx without help, so they kinda let it back here. Superman's eyes glow red as he explains that if she dies, they both got a one-way ticket to the Phantom Zone. Superman, followed by Samson and Atlas, stand before the Ultra Sphinx 
as it asks what happens when the unstoppable force meets the immovable object. They surrender. Response acceptable. Lois is freed, and the Ultra Sphinx disappears. She explains how weird it was to be both alive and dead at the same time. And then they begin to leave the underground caverns when Samson and Atlas ridicule Superman for being a coward and not taking them up on their challenge for Lois. So later at the Krakatoa Archipelago, Superman, Samson, and Atlas prepare for an arm wrestling match. If Superman wins, they both get into Samson's chronomobile and leave the 21st century. I'll be leaving with Lois Lane on my arm after I've defeated you, Superman. I only have one weakness. Scissors. You, I can... I can't quite I handle. To get a comfortable position. You can quit any time. Come on, fellas, or... Would you like me to push? It's this damn sea air. There's too much salt in my eyes. Come on. My arm! Take him, Atlas! He's... Weakening! Later, Superman and Lois conclude their time in Atlantis, and they fly higher and higher into the sky. And Lois says that the whole world can see what Superman's girlfriend, Lois Lane, sees in him. But what does he see in her? Why her, of all the people? Superman then flies her to the moon and says that there is something very special that he has wanted to do since the day they met. And they embrace and kiss passionately in the silence of space. You do a really good Clark Kent impression. Almost had me fooled. <sighs> Almost had me fooled. But where was Clark today? Anyway. I have a question for you too. I've I've been meaning to ask it for a long, long time. But things kind of got in the way. Lois will will you L Lois? And this episode, of course, like all the other ones, is brought to you by my comics, specifically the Custodians Agents of Cross. All-Star Superman is a love letter to the Silver Age, whether Grant Morrison intended it or not. The Custodians Agents of Cross is a love letter to the Silver Age, including all the fake advertisements you would see in one. Check it out. Look, wow, oh my gee whiz. It even has a soundtrack. Every issue of the Custodians Agents of Cross is going to be giant sized, just like this one. That is over 60 pages of pure comics. No boundaries, no limits, just pure comics. And you can get it yourself at my Etsy store, blaketwild.etsy.com. But the Custodians Agents of Cross is not the only series you can get there. No, no, no. You can also get all five issues of Destructo Boy. The greatest hero of the far-flung future is Destructo Boy. Set in a giant space station, read each issue as Destructo Boy battles increasingly more and more ridiculous villains. And sometime later, Jimmy Olsen arrives at Project HQ to write one of his famous For A Day columns. That's Grant Morrison's Way of explaining all the wacky stuff that Jimmy Olsen would get up to in his Superman's Pal Jimmy Olsen series in the 60s. It's all for his column that he writes. Leo Quintum, you see, is visiting an extraterrestrial species called the Electrokind. Tungsten gas life forms with class exoskeletons, and Jimmy is going to be taking his place as president of the ultimate futurist think tank. Jimmy is outfitted with one of Leo's rainbow coats, and as his first action as project director is to learn what project stands for. <laughs> Agatha leads Jimmy through the facility when they pass an ominously illuminated door that reads, do not open until doomsday. Jimmy asks what that's all about, and Agatha explains that it's just some legacy thing from Project's origins in the Project Cadmus division, and inside that vault is a stem cell accelerator designed to transform a soldier into an unstoppable killing machine. Then she takes him to check out the portal to the Underverse. Jimmy and Agatha stand over this large cauldron-like device, inside of which time itself cools to a solid. Within this endless pit, the Bizarro Infratex mine various materials from this, like, unknowable quantum atomic realm. 
of outside of space and below our universe. The tech on duty alerts them that whatever he's got is overloading all the equipment, and then the entire rig collapses. Jimmy falls but narrowly catches himself, and he's barely able to press his Superman signal watch, and Superman appears! Superman laments not being able to save that worker, but he pulls the rig arm that was collapsing the machine out of the bubbling pit comes Black Kryptonite. Later, Jimmy and Superman sit around as Agatha and her technicians inspect the Black Kryptonite. You know, for a moment, I, I, I kind of thought that it was that gypsy's curse that got put on me. But, <laughs> glad you heard it, Superman. But glad you heard the signal, Superman. It's that signal watch. Like I don't have enough to do without bailing you out of some stupid scrap every other day. You'd be dead without me. Uh, uh Superman? That rock? It, it, it did something to you, didn't it? It's just cheap moon base furniture. Quintum's loaded anyway. Think about it. I probably increased the value with my autograph. Okay. <gasps> Everything's gone. <sighs> Gone opposite, Jimmy. I know what black cake does. Ah, uh, it makes me bad. And you know what? Part of me is starting to like it. Oh no, Jim! I'm in a jam. I need your help. But you can't do anything. Who's gonna stop me from doing anything I want? You. Jimmy Olsen? And later, Agatha informs Jimmy that Superman helped them create three anti-Superman weapons. One is a Phantom Zone cannon that will be ready shortly, and the other one was kryptonite powered, but that doesn't work anymore. And Jimmy realizes that they need the third weapon, Doomsday. Superman crashes through the Daily Lee planet planet and slams into the Earth as Jimmy is teleported behind him. Superman tosses a car at Jimmy, but he dodges out of the way, then he grabs the golden syringe and stabs it into his neck, turning him into Jimmy Doomsday. And from his little uh, earpiece intercom, Jimmy is told that he has exactly 30 seconds before Doomsday overloads his nervous system, so he better hurry the fuck up. Superman punches him square in the face, but it does nothing, and Jimmy fires his heat vision into Superman, sending him through the facade of a store. Superman shouts that he am getting weaker, that he no want to die. Then he passes out as Jimmy turns back into his human form. Later at Project HQ, Jimmy and Superman rest in the med bay. Superman thanks Jimmy for being his pal and always being there to help him. Then Agatha informs Jimmy that they use their entire annual budget in one day, but Jimmy's like, no, 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 I saw your bank account. It has an infinity symbol in it. Then he continues his day as director of Project uh, with some very specific requests. Jimmy later returns home to his apartment to find his girlfriend Lucy Lane hanging out in the living room watching the news about Superman fighting that monster downtown. Jimmy tells her that he got to keep one of Leo Quintum's identical 365 rainbow coats, and he also got her some gifts. Two tickets to the Broadway smash hit Frankenstein on Ice, and a message to her written on the moon. Attila the Hun. Genghis Khan, Al Capone, Adolf Hitler, Lex Luthor. You freely admit that these vile and appalling criminals are the men you revere above all as heroes and role models. Your insane schemes have placed in jeopardy the lives of every man, woman, and child on this planet. Have you anything more to say before I deliver the verdict of this court? Superman made me do it. He should be on trial. It gives me great pleasure to deliver the verdict. Guilty on all counts of crime against humanity. The sentence is death in the electric chair. Later, Clark Kent is sent to interview Lex Luthor at Stryker's Island Death Row in the Bay of Metropolis. He arrives to find Lex in, like, this little workshop, working on his Bibliobot Mark II. It's a little floating robot that can recite hundreds of thousands of great works of literature. It's basically if a Kindle and a Roomba had a baby that could fly. 
Clark gets frightened when the Bibliobot starts hovering in the air very quickly and accidentally trips over a power cord that sets off the outlet. Clark bumbles his way to his feet and explains that he's here to conduct their interview. Lex removes his coat and leaves, beckoning Clark and the guards to follow. Later, Lex works out on a treadmill as he asks Clark what he honestly feels about Superman. Clark sheepishly says that, hey, he's always friendly around the office when he shows up. Lex then snatches Clark's notepad can't read his writing, and tosses it back as he moves on to his next exercise. Lex ponders to Clark to imagine a world where some alien vermin hadn't decided to dump its trash here, and then he brings up Lois. Perhaps if Superman hadn't been around, she'd have actually noticed good old Clark. Lex says that if Clark would just put in some weight training, he could probably have a physique that rivaled Superman. Then he tosses his weight onto the ground, startling Clark, and instructs the reporter to feel his muscle. Real muscle. Muscle that took hard work to achieve, unlike Superman. Then he leads Clark through the prison in one of Frank Quitely's beautifully rendered page layout. Clark asks why Lex squandered away his resources and intellect on such an unhealthy obsession with Superman, and Clark explains that he's been in prison so many times that Strikers has become a bottle city of his own. Lex is planning to transform the place into a new model of society. A living blueprint for a utopia. Then Parasite is wheeled through the hall as he screams that he's gonna gut Lex. Luther smirks at the foul little threats, and then Parasite begins absorbing power from somewhere and grows massive. Clark freaks out that Parasite is gonna absorb his powers as the creature begins taking down guards and a riot breaks out. Tear gas is fired. Clark stumbles through the clouds in panic. How did we get out here? What just happened? Superman, sir. It must have been Superman. I am in danger, he says. You are under my protection now, Kent. Kent! <coughs> I can't see! That could have been my skull! You oaf! This way! Come on! I said follow me, Kent! Never mind your glasses! B -b but I can't see without them! Everything's a, com a complete blur! Just run! Keep up! <laughs> I don't... Lex, I don't think it's... I don't think it's safe down here! My cell is down here. And that's where we're going. You want to live, don't you? Like a sun! Bullets won't stop him! He's he's converting the kinetic energy into just more mass! Damn it, you're right! Nothing left but a mouth and an appetite! <laughs> Get me out of here, Luther! He's gonna cause an earthquake! <laughs> he's choking on energy! Stuffed and bursting like some sickening overripe fruit! That... Poor man. His own greed engulfed him. See what happens to anyone who crosses me, Kent? Anyone who underestimates Lex Luthor? Liquefying, that's exactly how he'll look. That is how Superman will look at the end. And nobody threatens me! Nobody gets into Luthor's way! I've always liked you, Kent. You're a humble and honest, uncoordinated human. You are everything he is not. But you're just another weapon in my war against Superman. Watch how easily I make you, your paper, and the entire penal system completely unreliable. Then the inimitable Lex Luthor opened the floor and shook hands with a baboon in a Superman suit. Evening, Leopold. Lex then reveals the escape route excavated by Bibliobot using Melville's Moby Dick emitted at such a high frequency that it became a sonic drill and could carve through solid rock. Lex leads Clark down a staircase to the fucking River Styx where his niece, Nostalthia, or nasty for short, tells Lex that, uh, his eyebrows are off. So Lex quickly turns around and hastily draws a new one in its place, revealing one of my favorite things about this book is that Lex pretty much has alopecia. He has no hair on his body at all. Clark asks how Lex could do all of this, not just the secret tunnel he could easily escape from, but everything he's done in his entire life to this point. And Lex tells him that he's succeeded in his ultimate goal. He's finally killed Superman and he wants Clark to be the one to reveal it. And as Clark is sent down the river, 
Lex stands at the shore and says, There's no deep psychology behind the struggle between Superman and me. It's all very simple. How would you feel if someone deliberately stood in your way over and over again? If it wasn't for Superman, I'd be in charge of this planet! And now, he's dying. What more could I want? In the past, Clark and his father Jonathan stand together in their field watching the night sky. Jonathan recounts how they found Clark and that he's destined for great things. Then Crypto the Superdog crash lands. Clark Kent, aka Superboy, excitedly runs over to his best pal and asks where Crypto has been. Then they run over to that large tree that died last year after being struck by lightning and rip it out of the earth and play Superfetch. Superboy rockets up into the sky after Crypto. And John drives the tractor back to the farmstead, and he and Martha talk about their son, and how he doesn't belong on the farm anymore. And three men appear and offer their services as farmhands. Meanwhile, Superboy and Crypto fly around, play tug-of-war, and relax on the moon. The next day, Clark is introduced to the new farmhands. The guy with the fancy haircut is named Calvin Elder. The little guy was in the circus and is known as the pint-sized powerhouse. And the big fellow with the bandages doesn't talk much. Later that day, Clark tells his girlfriend Lana Lang about the newcomers when Clark's best friend Pete Ross returns to their table with drinks. They talk about what they're going to do with their lives, especially Clark since he's in college studying journalism. But Clark says that he's unsure of becoming a reporter and that Metropolis is overwhelming. Then he hears voices in the far distance about Superman flying away with an old man, and Clark makes the excuse that his stomach's upset and runs off. Later, he and Crypto spy on the three supposed farmhands as they inspect an old man's lifeless body. Pint-sized powerhouse says that the Chronovore ate the man's entire life. Then Cal Kent, Superman of AD 853500, appears behind Clark and Crypto. He introduces himself as a member of the Superman Squad, a collection of Superman that protect space-time itself. And the other Superman appear, the unknown Superman of AD 4500, and Klizzix Plicks. <laughs> Superman of the fifth dimension. Clark wonders that if they're apparently all of his descendants, does that mean that he marries Lana after all? And Cal Kent quickly brushes away this question for discussions of the creature that they're hunting, and the reason that their three men are here. They're after something called the Chronovore, which appears just down the road, chasing a herd of cows and turning them into various meat products that they were destined to become. 5D flies away with his hyperpoon in hand and prepares to spear the creature, and the unknown Superman flies after. Cal holds Superboy back as 5D lets loose his hyperpoon, then Clark heat visions Cal and escapes his grip to try and fight the Chronovore with them. Cal slams into Superman, accidentally exploding an old gas station, and orders Clark to stand down. Then Crypto tackles the Superman of the far flung future. Heck of a harvest, Mr. Kent. <clears throat> you boys did a fine job. I always say it's the work you put in that you get back. You know, my wife wants us to up sticks back to Smallville. This is the end of the line for me and the farm. <laughs> He'll be okay, won't he? The boy? It all comes out right in the end. I tried to warn you, if you face the Chronovore, it will eat a precious three minutes of your life. And in those three minutes, Jonathan Kent suffered a fatal heart attack. Pa! Why can't I hear his heartbeat? We've got it! Let go of the chain! Pa! I can save him! I can save everybody! Clark Kent stands before his family and friends as he gives a heart-touching eulogy to his father, Jonathan Kent. And sometime later, he helps his mother pack up the farm. Clark then breaks down on the porch, saying that he can't leave her alone. And she tells him that his father didn't want him to stay here in Smallville forever. Clark holds his hand in his hands and asks what the point of his powers are. What's the point of anything? <laughs> I didn't even get to say goodbye. The lightning door is open, Cal. Then we'll go to exit deep time and return to AD 863500. Thanks again. We couldn't have done this without you. At last, I can take off my bandages. I knew I had to conceal my identity from my younger self, because that's 
how I remember it happening, but thank you for the opportunity to see my paw one last time. But before you return to your home time, the leader of the Superman squad has something for you. Which of my descendants are you? <laughs> that was the day you joined forces with three generations of Supermen to chain the Chronovore. Another of your legendary twelve labors, I seem to recall. This is an indestructible flower from New Krypton. For him, from all of us, in remembrance of all that we are and all that we will be. Superman's seventh legendary labor involves Bizarro. Superman has to let go of his pet Sun Eater in a very Harry and the Hendersons moment because it's just gotten too big to keep at the fortress. And this is Frank Quitely's, I think, weirdest page, perhaps one of them of all time. But there's just something about this page that stands out to everything else. I think it's that the background is digitally added and the minimalism that the Sun Eater is rendered in, combined with the unquietly kind of shadows, I guess would make sense since they are in space, but it's just a strange looking page. It doesn't look like it was drawn by him. Anyway, Superman solemnly flies back to Earth and loops around Mars when he's attacked by horrible lumpy creatures and a strange version of himself and discovers Bizarro Earth has entered the universe. And meanwhile on Earth, Bizarros crash land to the planet and they begin attacking people and stealing their identities. And the people who have their likenesses stolen become horrible faceless Bizarro creatures that attack anything they see. Steve Lambard is forced to toss a woman out of a fucking window during a Christmas party and everyone at the Daily Planet make their way to the roof as the entire world is turned backwards and twisted wrong. Bizarro Superman crash lands to Earth followed by regular Superman. Bizarro flies at him with his heat breath and Superman tries out one of his new powers, electricity. Meanwhile, Jimmy and the others arrive at the roof where they commandeer an automated commercial blimp that Jimmy hacked into and the gang narrowly escape inside but are are unable to unanchor it from the building and the bizarros start pounding on the door. Jimmy calls Project over his watch and Leo's like, I thought I changed this number, but he takes the time to explain to Jimmy that they are dealing with a planet eater. The bizarro world is some giant organism from beneath their universe that mimics other worlds to appear less threatening before invading and consuming them. And yellow sunlight apparently makes them sick, which is why they attacked Earth's night side. Then Superman arrives and flies everyone to the mountains outside of Metropolis. Superman explains the situation about these new bizarros and what took him so long. Jimmy then informs him about the sunlight thing and suggests a giant space mirror of some sort to reflect the sun's rays. Superman takes note, then he turns to Lois and tells her that he'll be right back after he knocks some sense into that planet. He gives her a forehead kiss, wishes her a Merry Christmas, and flies away. Followed by Bizarro Superman, as the Bizarros clamber over one another and form tendrils to Earth, like the zombies from World War Z or something. Superman flies directly into the biggest mountain he can see and blows it the fuck up. Then the Bizarro Earth is pushed, and its giant flat oceans reflect the sunlight that destroy the invading Bizarros, and then the cubic planet opens a red portal back to the Underverse as it retreats. No surrender. Am no beat. Hurt more. Fight more. And by that, you mean the opposite, right? You, um, you no retreat to the Underverse and bother Earth again. No down sinkhole. Go to Underplace. No into cold us go, no freezing good dark no go, go. Your worlds burrowing back into the cosmic sink beneath our universe. That's why the light's receding. <coughs> I can't fly. My powers are already beginning to fade. Bizarro, I need your help or I will die here and leave my world in danger. I am good. You'll get no help there, Superman. But one in every five billion copies is flawed, unique, different, not mindless like these shambling mockeries, but sensitive and self-aware, suffering alone in a world of confusion. Call me Zibaro. Before 
Bizarro, Zabaro, and Superman stop looking for nothing worth unwhile in that space. Zabaro silences at Superman. See, that's what Bizarro language would be like. It would just... If you really go into that whole opposite thing, it starts getting really incomprehensible really fast. Anyway, Superman, Zabaro, and Bizarro wander the planet looking for anything worthwhile that they can use to get Superman back to Earth. Zabaro tells Superman that the Bizarros aren't like the ones he's familiar with. These ones do nothing but aimlessly meander around. Also, the planet is afraid of Superman now, and is making new Bizarros from his memory as a way to pacify him. Zabaro says that he is just like Superman. He's the only one of his kind on this planet. He's entirely alone, unlike anyone else. And then they watch as Bizarro, Perry, Lois, and Jimmy prance about, and Zabaro says that he's as trapped here as Superman is. Then, a voice comes from over the hill. Arr, me no have no plan for puny Superman! Great sons, Bizarro Jor-El? Me am no send father as baby near away from Bizarro home. Me no am Bizarro's world's greatest genius, Le Raj. His twisted behavior has made him king of all bizarros. At least until the All Night falls, when he'll be called upon to make the ultimate sacrifice. Lee Raj makes his way down to the two and brings out a scroll and does nothing to the conversation. Superman then tells Zabaro that he needs to build a spaceship capable of escaping the gravity well they are sinking into. Superman asks if he can get the Bizarros to help, and Zabaro says he may as well be giving orders to the wind. So Superman and Bizarro start rounding up the Bizarros as Superman shows them how to use a wheelbarrow. Then Bizarro and the others make fun of him for, for like, talking about a wheel and using it properly and leave. Wait! <sighs> Me am no want you am listen. Huh? <laughs> now him am no got me hooked. Ignore this! Ignore this! Liraj hands Superman a schematic as Superman bizarrely gives his plan of action to leave Bizarro civilization via a rocket. They all boo, and everyone gets to work. Superman starts getting tired as his strength wears off and the cancer of his body grows stronger, and he has also begun speaking to Bizarro in their backwards language, and Bizarro tells him happily that he has been punished and relinquished from not being no mayor of Bizarrotropolis. Very bad news indeed. And look, he also has his little Bizarro number one. And the Injustice League appear. Bizarro Green Lantern. He has the ultimate power in a nose ring and can make anything he thinks of, but he can't think of anything. Bizarro Flash. He has the top speed of two inches per hour. And Bizarro Wonder Woman, who was a baby that got turned into a cheap clay statue. I bet you're wondering where Bizarro Batman is. Well, he got shot to death by his parents. Later, Zabaro joins Superman atop a hill as Superman finishes creating an ion pulse engine. Your hands are shaking. You're growing weaker, aren't you? I don't know. It's just that everything's getting heavier. I was studying the blueprints and I, I couldn't help but notice there seems to be only room for one on your rocket ship. The chances of survival are slim. Even if you had powers like Super Bizarre. What do you mean? Why do I feel as if you haven't been listening at all? Don't you realize I'd take any chance to get away from here? I'd dare any peril. I cannot let you risk it, but you have my word. If I get home safely, I will find a way to contact you here in the Underverse. And one day, I promise, we'll meet again. I know how you think of yourself, as an imperfection, but you're something more, Zabaro. You are proof that Bizarro home is getting smarter. Why else would this world, this, this incredible organism, make eyes like yours to see beauty and meaning where others just see chaos? Okay. Well, I just wondered if maybe there was still time for you to, to take a look at my work. It's not much, it's just my thoughts, really, but before you go, if you could. The ceremony is over! The all night is coming to an end! Wait. No, sir. Uh, yeah, you can't. I see can't lunch without me. I am night's early dark. 
How shamefully quiet by a morning's first fading Thin stripes and gold stars through it they have the bull peace under trenches no watch and so pray them I can't do it I can't do it and no shells Dave, no proof all day long. No, so I'm sorry. Oh, say does Amstar Spangle shroud hang limply under land of no free. Am us home cowardly. Sevara. Sabaro! 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 You, you all want me to go? No go! Sabaro, no go! If only you knew how it felt to be so completely despised. This is my one and only chance to leave this horrible place. Me, I um, hate you all! Hello! Hello! Superman, you know I want what you have. Respect, love, a place to belong. But what if I found I was just as lonely on your world as I am anywhere else? Here. <clears throat> Let me help you. Invulnerability. Last to go. We're almost there. One last thing, Superman. Did you manage to look at my work after all? Your writing has... a unique quality, Zabaro. All these wonders seen. Keep it up. Tell the story of Bizarro Home. How they made a rocket ship out of garbage to shoot the Traveler home. I'll try. I'll try. You say I need heat to activate the engine? Yes? She no secret weapon. Just in time, Bizarro Flash. <laughs> Me no thank you for this ever, my friend. I know we'll meet again. Friend, no one's ever come. Oh no, Superman. I've messed up again. No problem. Back to plan A. Super Bizarro! Am no me to blame. You weaker than all. And no think so hard it hurt. Me I'm no sick of Superman insults. Grrr. Hello and bad riddance. Superman's rocket flies through Earth's atmosphere and crash lands outside a circus or some kind of ren fair that's being set up. He apologizes for startling the people and flies away, hoping he's not too late to repair the damage caused by the Bizarro invasion. He soars to Metropolis and finds it's been repaired and is now full of native Kryptonian architecture, and it's also like two months later. Clark Kent shows up to work after having been missing for two months, and he tells Perry that he was locked in his closet during the Bizarro invasion and survived on unopened Thanksgiving baskets. Fortunately, Superman heard his cries for help and saved him. Then he's handed a paper detailing Earth's new champions. And elsewhere, Earth's newest champions are a pair of surviving Kryptonians named Bar-El and Lilo. They have just finished creating a network of tunnels around an erupting volcano to cause it to collapse, and then discuss where to place the new capital of New Krypton. Lilo suggests they clear the apes out of Metropolis and just build it there. Then Superman shows up and instantly recognizes them. They were the first astronauts of Krypton who got lost somewhere in space, and now they're here. And they're complete assholes to him. They tell him that he could have built a new Krypton and laid the foundation stones of tomorrow, but instead he just lets the humans do their mindless dribble. Superman asks what right he has to impose his values on anyone else, and they all fly away. Back to the Fortress of Solitude, where they tell him that he should not have left his key lying around. He also discovers that they demolished the statues of his parents and replaced them with statues of themselves. They tell Superman that he lacks any drive and ambition, but they will make Krypton live again by restoring Kandor and even the criminals of the Phantom Zone, as even they are far more naturally noble 
than the humans. Bar L then heat visions Superman, uppercuts him, headbutts him, and knees him before the two carry him out, toss him to the moon, and then back to Earth. Bar L announces that they claim this planet as New Krypton, and Superman notices that they broke the moon. So what do they do? Bar L and Lilo stitch it back together with bridges from around the world. At the Daily Planet, Jimmy shows off his new Kryptonian fashion style as Clark deals with a nosebleed. Then everyone notices Bar L and Lilo floating outside. They ask what kind of self-loathing degenerate Superman is to disguise himself as a human. Lombard obviously thinks that they're talking about him and have mistaken him for Superman. And then Lilo starts to waver in the sky and plummets straight to the street below. But she's caught by Superman. Barrel lands and realizes that he also can't fly. Superman scans Lilo's body and deduces that they must have passed through some kind of radioactive cloud in space that has caused the minerals in their very bodies to turn into kryptonite. Superman says that he can help them, and Barrel breaks down as he and Lilo both lose their sight. He exclaims that they don't belong on this world and that they want to just be with their own people. And later at the fortress, Superman provides bar -El and Lilo with a place to remain together until he can restore their bodies. He's sending them to the Phantom Zone. bar -El tells Kal-El that he's proud to have him as kin and says that Krypton lives on in him. bar -El and Lilo then join hands, resolute in their fate that they may stay together and are sent into the Phantom Zone. Sometime later, at 7.02 a.m., Superman gives a busload of children in a cancer ward a tour across the globe. At 11.25 p.m., Kal-El writes his last will and testament. At 10.25 a.m., Leo Quintum is shrunk down and sent into Candor to speak to the council about a solution to deminiaturize the citizens. 12.01 a.m. When I am gone, when I'm not around anymore, to protect them from mad scientists and monsters and, and themselves. Can they survive their own self-destructive urges? There was only one way to study a world without Superman. I had to make one. Deep in the tangled briar of gas clusters forms the barely beating heart of a sickly infant universe of quick. I found a promising speck of grit. I applied a nano-optical transfusion of pure solar energy, and Earth Q breathed it in. There, on the hostile shores of an infinitesimal oceans, life seized its moment. 4.35 p.m. Superman saves a monorail from derailment and overhears a man inside talking to someone named Reagan over the phone, telling her not to leave the apartment and that he is on his way. Superman arrives at a nearby construction site and discovers that the workers found a strange box inside. The year written on it is uh, 23 of 12. Then a giant robot appears, Lois in its grip, and she tells Superman just not to ask how she ended up in this situation, as the robot proclaims that it is the true Man of Steel. Superman flies through its head, revealing an old man inside, and Lois tells him that the guy has Alzheimer's and is apparently after Lex Luthor. Superman deals with this, and then takes Lois back to the ground, where she reveals that she was captured by Mechano Man because it was the easiest way to get his attention. Then she reveals that Leo told her all about Kal-El's solar radiation overdose and his approaching death. You can't die. Promise me you'll find a way. Oh, Reagan, oh my god, I'm on my way. Don't put the phone down. I have to go, Lois. Someone needs me. Your doctor really did get held up, Reagan, and it's never as bad as it seems. You are much stronger than you think you are. Trust me. 11 a.m. Leo Quintum begs for the Kandorians to consider a life beyond the bottle instead of, instead of preserving their own endangered species and watching as their home just fades away to extinction under an artificial sun. Then a group of five Kandor Emergency Corps members appear in the council chambers and says that they want to fight to save Superman. Finally replaced the last of Earth's bridges. G C C T G T A T T T T C C C T T G G A T. Well, you won, Luther. 
I'm dying. But the world is yours. At least for the next three weeks that you have left before they execute you. Three weeks, Lex. I challenge you. All those things you said you would have done to benefit humanity if I hadn't been in your way. It's not too late to put that brilliant mind to work. Lex, I know there's good in you. <laughs> Let us not yield sovereignty even to them. The highest of angelic hierarchies become instead like them. At 9.10 p.m., Superman opens that little box from the year 2312. And inside, he finds a small ball with a little hologram of a man inside. It's a recording of a super scientist from the 24th century named Rumaktu. He says he cannot interfere with the past, but he has to let Superman know about the future. Because Superman saved Rumaktu's ancestral grandmother in the 21st century. He tells Superman about something called the Solar Intelligence System. To the proud survivors of Kandor, my kin, I leave a third golden age. On Mars, they're as powerful as I am, but still far enough away from human culture to allay the fears of Counselor Zora and others like her. Why did I never think of them? Why did I not trust them enough to think of this? They, like you, they want to ennoble the lives around them. Think of a living Kryptonian culture free to breathe and expand and interact with the human world in a whole new way. Behold, I teach you the Superman. I see Mechano Man. I see Mechano Man on a rampage in Metropolis. I should get going. But before I do, Leo, you told me that you've always been frustrated at your inability to read my DNA code. I finally copied the entire 8 billion letter sequence into a book. Are you... Are you saying you entrust me the responsibility of your genome? Along with the instructions on how to combine human and Kryptonian strands. This is how much I trust you, Leo. 6.45 p.m. We're sorry, Kal-El. Even with our speed and stamina, we can't prevent your white blood cells from committing suicide. I'm sorry, but after all you've done for us, we failed you. All of you did everything you could. The truth is, I only needed your help long enough to accomplish today's tasks. I never expected you'd be able to save me. But human diseases would be no match for your knowledge and power. Kandorian micro-doctors could cure anything. Hello, everyone. I, I just dropped by to uh, tell you all that I might not be able to make it next week. But don't worry, because you'll all be going home long before that. I brought some friends to meet you. I really think this is it. Third time lucky. This is the one. This is going to change everything. Three weeks later, Lex Luthor is attached to the electrical chair at Stryker's Island, and the switch is flipped. Luthor's body sizzles and smokes as it lies slumped over in the large chair. Then he wakes up laughing and reveals that he got his hands on a 24-hour superpower serum that he designed and placed into his last drink. He then heat visions everyone inside and erupts out of the execution room to the cheers of the other inmates. At the fortress, Superman cleans out the Sun Eater's gravity stable along with Robot 7. Superman finishes up and stumbles before Robot 7 catches him. Then they walk through the fortress. Superman tells Robot 7 that he needs their help. When he's gone, it's up to the robots to maintain the fortress and keep it secure. They walk past the Bizarro Zoo and into Superman's Hall of Relics, where he gives Robot 7 Zabaro's poetry to be super laminated and kept safe. Back in Metropolis, Nastalthia speaks to Lex's sister before Lex himself appears in their hideout. Then Lex gets about creating several robots and gives his niece a helmet with which to control them. Then they both head out of the abandoned subway station and onto the streets of Metropolis, right as Solaris the Tyrant Sun has appeared. For the entire story, Lex has been referring to the fact that he has friends in high places, and he meant it 
quite literally. Back at the fortress, Superman ends the record of his life and last will before donning an entirely new suit and preparing to face his final adventure. He walks to the entrance of the Fortress of Solitude one final time, and then all of his robots appear behind him and tell Superman that they won't let him stand alone on this day. Superman hides the key under the welcome mat, dons his helmet, and leaves one final superbot inside to guard the fortress and keep it safe. Place the sun in the sky. Your people will bow, pray to me, or die in darkness. Get back! He'll wipe your files! Save yourselves! Robot 7 must atone. Solaris invaded neural network. Solaris stole formula from Robot 7. Stole formula, formula, I'm Robot 7. Robot 7, Luther, Robot 7 must atone for forgive me, give me, give me, Bush. What is this? Abomination! That is the natural enemy of a living solar computer, Tyrant Sun. Meet Sun Eater. Killed him. You killed him! Back in Metropolis, Jimmy and Lois run into Nostalgia as she and Lex's robots rampage their way through the city. She tells them to spread the word that today is the first day of a new world. A world without Superman. And elsewhere, Solaris crashes into the street, followed by Superman, who orders everyone to take cover. Superman tells Solaris that he is aware that by the 24th century, the living solar computer will have been properly rehabilitated to work for humanity. Well, today is Solaris's first day on the 12-step program. Solaris begs for mercy and Superman punches him so hard that Solaris' light dies out, leaving behind his wrecked suit and helmet and Solaris's like, mainframe engine thingy. <laughs> Meanwhile, Clark sprints into the office and tells people that he just witnessed the entire thing go down. He has tomorrow's big headline. He wrote it all out. And then Clark Kent falls on his laptop, having suffered a heart attack as Lois and Jimmy appear. Clark is the least of your worries. Why did you bring me all the way from the science plaza during a massive core quake, Jor-El? Do you even realize how busy we are at the Neo-Consciousness Labs? I have something I must tell you, my son. I'm dead, Kal-El. I died when the world of Krypton tore itself apart. Myself. Your mother. Our people are all gone. Father, this is Krypton. Do, do you have scarlet spore fever? What is wrong? Turn us around. I'm televoicing Dr. Lexor. You've come among the dead, my son. You too are dead. You died defending humankind against the tyrant's son, Solaris, after a toxic overdose of yellow solar radiation. Consider us. A whole civilization of supermen, reduced to dust by a caprice of cosmology. Then think how perilous and fragile all the little things you value are. But... but your machine stabilized Krypton's core. If I'm dead, what... what is this? Your body is undergoing a conversion to solar radio consciousness. You must surrender to the process. The choice is simple. To remain at play within the field of living, fluid consciousness. Or to turn and face down evil one last time. There's one more. You have shown them the face of the man of tomorrow. You have given them an ideal to aspire to. Embodied their highest aspirations. They will race and stumble and fall and crawl and curse and finally they will join you in the sun, Kal-El. In time, you will no longer be alone. For Krypton, it was always too late. But the best of us, the gold in us, will survive in you. And all that is impure will be burned to ash 
and all that is strong and great and true will survive and be reborn. Clark wakes up as Lex taunts the newsroom and Lois and Jimmy tell him that Solaris double-crossed him by poisoning the sun and he got played like a fiddle. Lex says that he'll just repair the sun after he takes his revenge. Show me what you got, Luther! Oh! What? Anyone else feel like acting out in front of the most powerful man on Earth? <laughs> huh? Uh... There's me, Lex. I, uh... Can't. Uh, maybe you should stop threatening my friends, and everyone else, for that matter. So the little worm grows a spine to impress the girl. What is that? What are you trying to hide? This is a gravity gun. <laughs> hey, uh, we always keep a spare. Nice uh, disguise, Superman. I guess you've been keeping the real Clark in your fortress, right? Clark's safe, Jimmy. Leave Luther to me. Kent? No. There's an amazing idea. I should be writing these down. Gah! I know where you are, Superman. I don't need to see through lead when I can liquefy it with a hard stare. Did you ever think it would end with me looking down on you like this? As a matter of fact, I had the whole thing paced out to the end pretty much exactly like this, Lex. I suspected your involvement since Robot 7's malfunction during the Xenogene serum preparation. Oh, if I die, you die first! No more tricks! Lay down your weapons and surrender. Everything will be fine. This is only a phase transition to a new way of life. And yes, I expect the president to be waiting with the keys to the White House. <laughs> Seeing across the entire electromagnetic spectrum, Einstein failed to unify the gravitational force with the other three, but he, he had no experience of this. It's... <laughs> it's so obvious. I can actually... See and hear, and feel and taste it. The fundamental forces are yoked by a single thought. These new senses, I can actually see the machinery. The wiring connecting and separating everything since it all began. This is how he sees all the time. It's all just us in here together. And we're all... Uncle Lex, you're literally embarrassing me beyond all therapy. He is just trying to articulate how gravity warps time and how I forced his metabolism to accelerate to compensate. He's trying to tell you that his 24-hour powers just ran out. You were right, Lex. Brain beats brawn every time. No! You're supposed to be dead! I had it timed! I saw how to save the world! I could make everyone see! I could have saved the world if it wasn't for you! You could have saved the world years ago. If it actually mattered to you, Lex. Superman! Oh, your poor face! <laughs> I'm fine, Lois. If he hadn't fatally overdosed me with sunlight, then I wouldn't have had the power to attempt the final feat. Uh, Lois, my... My cells are converting to pure energy. Pure information. And I only have moments to save the world. I love you, Lois Lane. Until the end of time. That's more than you've ever needed.
A year later, the sun rises over Project's moon base. Leo, Quintum, and Agatha prepare to attend the Superman memorial service that's being held later that day in Metropolis. Leo says that a world without Superman is going to be quite a challenge to humanity, and that it is now their responsibility to make sure that the world is taken care of whilst he's away. Agatha asks what happens if Superman never returns, and Leo says that now that they have an understanding of Kryptonian DNA, he's sure they'll come up with something. In Metropolis, Lois Lane sits alone in the park, before the statue commemorating Superman. Jimmy arrives via jetpack and asks if she's sure that she doesn't want to say anything at the Superman memorial service tonight. But Lois tells him that he's not dead. She knows he's still up there. He's working on keeping their son alive and safe. And when he's done, he'll know where to find her. And deep within the raging heart of the solar system's only son, stands another solar system's last son. The end. I hope you enjoyed this episode of What Is. It is quite a long one based on the runtime of this recording, about two hours. Let me know what you thought of it in the comments below, what you thought of the video, what you thought of the comic. I absolutely love Grant Morrison. I love All-Star Superman. It always makes me cry. It made me cry when I was writing this script. It made me cry when I was editing the video. What can I say that hasn't been said about this story already, really? Uh, I do have a couple notes that I guess I'll just go over. Um, I loved the, uh, you know... Uh, love letter to the Silver Age aspect of it. Silver Age, as I've said many times before, and the Custodians Agents of Cross clearly proves, is my favorite era of comics. Um, even though Grant Morrison said themselves that it wasn't necessarily meant to be a lot like, you know, purely Silver Age. It was all of Superman's history up to that point, which, you know, makes sense when you see stuff like, you know, Joe Schuster and the farm scenes and young Superman or Superboy. Um, the point where he gets a new superpower and it's lightning, which is a reference to blue Superman from the nineties. You'd have to assume, which I unironically love. I really dig blue electric Superman. I, I like it. It's cool. Um, my favorite one though, is the Kandorians flying out of Superman's palm, which used to be a real power that he had when he was in the sixties. Uh, Superman could fire out a six inch version of himself complete with the costume that when expelled out of the palm of his hand had all the powers of superman but superman had none of the powers they all went to this little tiny version of himself earth q is a fantastic just meta concept it's our universe our own universe that we are inhabiting now is a just a block universe created by Superman in which we then thus create Superman over and over again through history. That's what those flashes to Earth Q represent is that there is always this intrinsic mythological thought and aspect of a purely good and hope and survival and safety that humans have. Superman has always been here just in various instances and it wasn't until the 30s that Joe Schuster and uh, Jerry Siegel put it into such an ultimate being that everything from all of human history and all these mythologies finally came together to wear blue spandex, red underwear outside of his pants, and a giant shield on his shirt with a big cape. I love that it's just, it goes about the influence that Superman has upon our world and the influence that we have upon Superman's world as creators of uh, his, like, 2D universe. This universe within a universe within a universe we are witnessing. I highly recommend reading Super Gods by Grant Morrison. I, this is my favorite book of all time. It is part autobiography by Morrison. It is part history of superhero comics and philosophy. I've read this thing probably about five or six times now, I think, and I'm really due for a reread. If you can't tell by how beat up and crappy this cover looks, fucking fantastic book. I cannot recommend it enough to superhero fans, to comic book fans who want to learn more about the history. And, like, the weird history, too. The stuff that, you know, they don't really talk about, like, the first, uh, uh, like, sort of cross-dressing superhero who I believe, if I remember correctly, is called Hishi, and it's <laughs> it's a man split down the center. One side's like dressed a woman, one side's dressed as a man. Uh, stuff like that, and it it just speaks a lot about Grant Morrison and who they are, who he is. Um, it goes about his life, his father's family, experiences in the comic book history, experiences 
in life. Um, if you've ever read um, uh, the Flex Mentalo series, you'll see a lot of it in here, and a lot of a fair amount of that stuff is inspired by Grant Morrison's own life. Uh, the very specific stuff, that is. But I highly recommend it. One of the best things Grant Morrison's ever written. And now I'm going to get to my own little theory upon this book. Uh, Leo Quintum, the character created specifically for this and his little Technicolor dream coat. Um, people think that he's Lex Luthor. People, you know, think that he is whoever else. He's like Lex Luthor from the future, gone back to the past. Uh, they think he's anything from here to there. Uh, but here's my little thoughts on who Leo Quintum is and what he represents. I'm going to read from this because this is a giant paragraph of text and there's no way I'm going to be able to remember everything coherently. Uh, nearly everyone important in Superman's life has the initials LL. Lana Lang, his first love. Lois Lane, his once and future wife. Lori Lamaris, that mermaid that he dated for a little bit. <laughs> Lex Luthor, his greatest enemy. And finally, when we arrive at the end of Superman's existence as both we, the reader, and everyone in his current life as Superman knows it, we meet someone named Leo Quintum. Now, I know what you're thinking. His initials are LQ. Well, what if I told you that his surname is obviously a portmanteau of quantum and the numeral prefix quin, meaning five. Everyone knows that the Roman numeral for five is V. That's a simple one. Everybody knows that. Star Wars taught people that. And then after that, it's a bunch of X's and I's and V's until you get to numbers above 39. Specifically, the number 50. Uh, the number 50 in Roman numerals is L, making Leo Quintum's initials LL. Leo Quintum, I believe, is one of Superman's greatest characters because he is the person who made Superman transcend their universe and ours. Superman learned he was dying from Leo. This entire 12 issue series was in a way started because of Leo Quintum and Superman transcends his being by re-energizing the sun not to appear again until DC Comics 1 million in the far flung future. And in our world, All-Star Superman is heralded as one of the most quintessential Superman stories. Thank you. <laughs> but that's really all I have to say about Superman, uh, All-Star Superman. As always, check out my uh, Etsy shop for great comics like The Custodians, Agents of Cross, number one, giant-sized first issue. I have issue two completely finished, um, and issue three is being worked on as we speak. I'm penciling those pages right now. Uh, so check this out. Show me that you want it. <laughs> because I did not make many copies of this first printing, so, if you want to get it, better hurry up before they run out. Uh, Destructo Boy issues 1 through 5, also limited uh, availability on those as well, so if you want fun sci-fi zaniness about a little robot boy, um, again, I'm going to be at Yumicon October 7th and 8th. I had a great time at Tucson Comic Con meeting some fans, so if there's anybody uh, around the Yumicon, Yuma area, Southern California, Southern Arizona, stop on by. I'll be there both days. And, um, yeah, that's all I have to say. Bye.